We welcome everyone who's here already. We will start in just a couple minutes. All right, welcome everybody um, to this session on making mentorship work. I am pleased to introduce you to our two speakers today, Matt Dunphy and Rob Southwick. Matt Dunphy is the Director of Special Programs for the Wildlife Management Institute, which is a 101-year-old nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to science-based professional wildlife management. He also serves as the Director of the Chronic Wasting Disease Alliance, co-chair of the National Hunting and Shooting Sports Action Plan, Chair of the North American Wildlife and Natural Resources Conference, as well as many other professional committees. Matt has conducted dozens of multi-day trainings and information workshops for state and federal wildlife agency staff and administrators on R3 strategies, program development, evaluation, and best practices. Matt, we're happy to have you here today. Thank you. As for Rob, Mr. Rob Southwick founded the Southwick Associates in 1990. Uh, more recently, for the past 10 years, Southwick Associates has led efforts to design and evaluate R3 efforts, identifying successes as well as failures, or as I like to call them, lessons learned, with the goal of improving overall R3 results. Southwick works with the American Sport Fishing Association, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, the Outdoor Industries Association, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, most state fish and wildlife agencies, as well as many others. Welcome, Rob, we're happy to have you here today too. Great, thanks for having us, really appreciate it. All right, it is all yours, guys, take it away. Okay, thank you much, and thanks to the, I guess, 349 people that are on this call, this is fantastic. Um, let me just jump right into a couple things, given the format that we have. I wanna make this clear right off the bat. Here's what we hope y'all learn today. So we recognize that to present controversial findings, which we have some, and to discuss as a community, this online virtual medium is the worst way to go. But thank you, COVID-19, for the gift that keeps on giving. Don't worry, science is coming for you, so enjoy it while you can. But I want to acknowledge that Rob and I would really love to have this conversation in a very different way. Ideally, we're all face-to-face, we can talk to you and ask you about some of your assumptions. We can present some data that we've discovered. And then as a community, we can decide what to do with that. Unfortunately, you all are on mute. I can't see your faces, you can't see ours. So we're gonna have to chug through this. I hope what we can do is hold enough of your attention that you'll look back on this and at a minimum say, huh, I should probably read that report or the summary that is in your forum packet that Samantha and Kristen and Sawyer worked so hard to put together. So I want to acknowledge that right off. Now, how are we going to try to go about this? Here's the deal, y'all. The data that we have from this project that Rob and I have been working on for several years now um, is in about 100 pages. We can't share all of that here. So what we did is we pulled out the stuff that we thought, as well as leaders within the R3 community, mainly the R3 regional associations, the things that we thought were either A, controversial in that they challenge current assumptions about what mentoring is, or B, things that we thought particularly useful for those of you who are doing what we have been calling mentoring type programs or some other programmatic R3 effort where you're trying to teach people stuff. So what we want to do is run through those. Rob is going to unceremonially interrupt me frequently when I start to drone like I'm already doing. 
and answer questions that you all may have. Now we've got a, hand, a, a lot of stuff to get through, so I wanna fire away on some things and then we wanna pause to, to get your questions where they're appropriate. So please pay attention. You're ready to be if I could cut you off right now, I'm sorry, I heard you mention my name. I was just knocking out some text right here, but um, I just think at the beginning, I wanted to give a quick shout out to DJ Case too, a big part of this project. So um, it's actually three of us, the um, three amigos that put together this awesome project. And just wanna point out too that it's a great team. Back at you. <laughs> See, this is how it's going to work, folks. Thank you, Rob. And also, I, I do want to extend um, a big thank you to the regional associations, uh, the, uh, particularly the R3 committees they're in, who helped frame this project from the beginning. In many ways, I see this, this project is their vision project. And then um, all of the other experts within the R3 community who helped make this happen. OK, moving on. So first off, what's the purpose of this project? Honestly, it's so Rob can take me fishing again and uh, we can do this more. Unfortunately, thank you again, COVID, we couldn't. And we had to do this project completely remotely. So yes, I'm really bitter and I'm gonna take that out all on the findings in this presentation. So if you feel the anger, it's because I wasn't able to go fishing for speckled trout uh, as a consequence of this project. Now, what are we really trying to do with this? In a nutshell, the reason why we started this project, everybody, is because for, for, for those of you that have been in R3 for the last decade, and, and probably for those of you that have that are newcomers, and, and really glad you're all here, we have assumed that this thing we call mentoring is one of the primary keys to the future of R3. However, we have been massively uninformed by information that tells us if that is true, or if the efforts that we're currently doing that we call mentoring, are in fact working. So this project, let me say very clearly, does not give us all the answers. What we wanted to do was to take an initial deep dive to help us understand where our definitions of mentoring might be wrong, what mentoring actually means, and then maybe most importantly, what the potential mentors or the potential mentees actually want or need from us. So what we're gonna share with you is what we learned from a combination of things to get at those very first level facts. Now, again, let me reinforce, these findings are not conclusive. In, in many cases, they give us a bit of an answer, but in many other cases, they simply tell us what direction we need to inquiry further. And that's an important point as we go through here, there will be a second round of research here going next year, the multi-state grant was awarded to do so. We have challenged many of our own assumptions and there's many things out there that we're surprised on. So please, when you hear us say something or you read something here and you don't believe it, we need to hear it. Please let us know. Back to you, Matt. Excellent. Okay, formally, these are the objectives of this multi-state conservation grant. Thanks a lot to AFWA and Fish and Wildlife Service and the WISFER program that made these dollars available to do, to do this. Um, thankfully, we as a community have a lot more dollars um, uh, thanks to really organizations like Character Trade Association, the Council of Advanced Hunting and Shooting Sports, and a lot of partner groups who have really inflated the field of funds that allow us to um, inquire along the lines that we're doing in this project. So thank you all out there who are pushing forward on this. But these are the things that we wanted to sort of formally explore. And I'm not going to go back to these because this project evolved and we went into the direction again that the community needed and where the inquiry led us. But essentially what these mean is we want to know, we want to discover the information that will help you as practitioners understand what is useful in programmatic mentoring or any other sort of mentoring R3 efforts to implement in your states or organizations. Okay, now the process part of, a, of the final, of the large report is many, many pages long. And as a scientist, I usually like to spend time here because I like to validate that our process was both informed as well as thorough, um, but we don't have time. So roughly, this is the process we followed to get to the data we're gonna show you. Number one is we, we figured out the world as it is. So of those organizations and agencies that are saying they're doing mentoring programs, what are those programs? And what are their structural components to help us understand what we as a community are thinking of when we say a mentoring program? Next, we went to the R3 committees, the ex experts of the field, many of you who are on this, this call probably, or this presentation. And we 
asked about, hey, what are the most useful lines of inquiry for you? We took the combination of those two things and then we started to ground truth some of these questions we had in our mind by doing virtual focus groups. This is really where, again, Phil Sang and DJ Case were stellar and instrumental in this project by doing virtual focus groups in the evenings of the audiences, the target audiences of these mentoring programs, as well as the instructors or potential instructors that might be involved. We wanted to hear what they think, what their barriers were, what their issues were, what concerned them, what did they want? And we've got, we have videos of these online focus groups. Uh, Matt Harlow has all recorded. We'll have those posted at some point too. But if you're into the focus group research, really, really cool. It's fascinating how it works it's online. I highly recommend you looking at them just that purpose alone. Yeah, exactly. And in this era of um, virtual stuff, I think it really validated the fact that you all don't need to rely exclusively on in-person focus groups. There's a lot to be learned from the virtual side. And I'll have to say, as a curmudgeon myself, I was skeptical until I saw it. So this is also a challenge. I'm going to point my finger back at you all. No excuses to not do focus groups. You can do them virtually, you can do them cheap, and you can do them thoroughly. So no more saying, oh, we just don't have the time and budget. Nope, we proved that you can. Okay, moving on. So after we we were we sort of collated all this or collated all this information that we got to this point, we know what mentoring programs were out there. We sought the expertise of the committee. Then we actually ground truth some things with the actual participants and those involved with these programs. We then designed large scale surveys that we could send out to a representative population of the U.S. that represented the U.S. population, um, and and find what the folks out there who potentially want to be what we have been calling mentored and those who might be potential mentors um, found out a lot about those audiences. And that's what we're going to talk about. What did we find from them after the data crunching and discussion that can help inform us on how we think about mentoring and how we go forward in implementing these type of efforts? Now, Way too much data, so don't bend your brain on this, but I did want to point out something that I'm very proud of, and I give Rob and his team 100% of the credit, and that is if you look over here in this top graph, and particularly the right side, you can see, look at the unweighted percentages of the demographics of those who answered the survey. And if you look closely, what you'll see pretty quickly is they did a darn good job of getting representative samples uh, uh, of survey respondents representative of the U.S. population. And for those places where we missed it some, like particularly in our study, um, the Hispanic or Latino audiences were underrepresented in the unweighted percentage. So we, we did some math to add more weight to their answers to correct for a little bit of unrepresentation. But in large part, I think we did a really good job. You, I think you can see the same thing in the age distribution. We didn't get all just old people. Um, even though we may weigh a little bit more toward that side, we got a pretty good cut across to everybody else. More details in the report, but I just as we go forward here, I want you to know we're not, I don't think this is skewed much in any way. Okay, let's jump in. Thank you, Mr. Curmudgeon. <laughs> Always pl pl happy to help. Okay, probably one of the prime biggest questions I've been asked and probably Rob has been asked since the very beginning of our three is, how many potential new hunters or shooters are there out there? Do we have any idea? Well, I think thanks to this survey, we've got a pretty good answer. So about 10% of the respondents that said they were interested in being a potential hunting mentee, and about 18% of those who uh, said, or excuse me, about 10% of respondents said they were interested in learning, and 18% of of respondents said they're interested in shooting sports. Now, if we extrapolate that out a bit, if our survey sample was representative of the U.S. population, folks, what this tells us is there is a ton of Americans who are interested in becoming hunters and shooting sports participants, much more than we have now. And what I think is interesting here is they are they are specifically interested in being instructed personally. So that was one of the criteria for the respondents, the, the filter they had to go through. They were interested in being instructed. And that's this is how big that audience might be. Right now, point out here that there's a lot of overlap here, of course, too. Is that 50.5 million or is a lot of people who like to, to go shooting and go hunting? But all those details are in the report. Yep. Okay. So that's the good news. 
All right, so let's get into, I don't know if it's bad news or not, it just is. What we are currently doing that we are classifying as a community as mentoring programs, I don't think are. And hold on here, I just clicked off. And I'll give you, I'll give you two numbers that demonstrate that. When we did a first cataloging of mentoring programs, this is where we went to state fish and wildlife agencies and NGOs and asked them um, to tell us about the programs that they classify as mentoring programs. Okay, so we went to them and said, hey, do you do anything that's called mentoring? If so, give us some stats and some data on those programs. Let me give you just two pieces of data that I think undermine why I don't think these are mentoring programs. Number one, the average student to instructor ratio between hunting mentoring programs and shooting sports mentoring programs, self-identified mentoring programs, that student to instructor ratio was 11 to one. That's the average. They weren't even close to the, the original idea or the origin story of mentoring, which is a one-to-one -one relationship. So it's 11 to one. And only 38% of those programs even had a single field experience. So bottom line is actually when you look at those structurally, they look a lot more like a skills training event than this ideal of mentoring that we talk about where one individual walks somebody else through the entire process, multiple experiences over time, skills, knowledge, trial, and so forth. What we're doing now doesn't measure up to that. Uh, gut punch number two, as it turns out, the potential mentees, and I'm not going to call them mentees anymore. I'm going to call them potential students. They don't like the term mentor. And folks, this wasn't just a slight indication. This was an overwhelmingly consistent finding across the virtual focus groups and in the survey. And I th I'll sum it up with the way one young lady on the focus groups described it. And it really summed up the, the overall sentiment. Mentoring is a title that an individual earns from somebody else. It cannot be assigned at the outset. And if you assign it at the outset, the student felt that they were in this tiered relationship that they didn't ask for. However, the student said, if I'm with someone that I trust and I learn and we have shared experiences over time, I might call them a mentor, but I might not. And I, I'll even note that the potential instructors themselves were mostly neutral about the point. They didn't have a strong feeling. I think it was less than, um, way less than 10%, somewhere around only 5% of potential instructors preferred mentor. Over 60% of them, or around 60% of them said, we don't really care what you call us. So yeah. from this point forward, I think we need to drop this term because it's not descriptive of what the students want. It's not descriptive of what the mentors want. And frankly, it's not super descriptive of what we're doing right now. Rob, it's, uh, a it's gonna be difficult in, in ways that Matt and I are gonna be pushing um, with others to change this term because mentoring is so ingrained. It's one of the assumptions we had in a long time. We tested this question because really it's kind of one of these personal assumptions. We weren't sure if it really existed or not. And my personal viewpoint came into it as um, as a parent. Now, to me, a mentor, I had visions of some old person I didn't know walking my child off into the woods alone. And we're afraid that there's other connotations to other terms. So we tested these terms. We'll look into them a little bit more next year. But it's important that we have to regulate ourselves and change these terms. We don't slip and use these terms when we're talking to the public, especially these new recruits. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, Chad, you're right. It's a four letter word. Mentor. Back. <laughs> well, and I'm going to push back on that a little bit, but hopefully y'all are getting the realization that sort of the, the Candyland version of the R3 form is over now. We're going to be kicking pretty hard. And I want you to think critically. I want everyone to reserve the right to be offended and be mad and upset and challenge these findings because that only in that way will we move forward as a community. The report says what it says, but we need to look more at this and identify, you know, um, if there is a difference, if there is truly this thing called mentoring that works, what actually is that? How is that defined? What characterizes it specifically from other institutional R3 programs? We need to do some more work on that. And as Rob indicated, we're going to be doing that next year because we have another multi-state grant. Thanks again to um, AFWA and all those on the grants committee um, to keep digging into this because we recognize for as many questions as we answered, 
we opened up two or three more. Sound good okay. research. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, another really interesting one here. So again, these findings are cherry picked. There's dozens and dozens of these, but these are kind of compilations of the aha moments that we and the others in the community that saw these kind of had. And there's another one. Just because someone has tried it in the past doesn't mean they don't need personal instruction. Um, and here's some numbers. This is, I think this is really interesting. Of those individuals that said, again, let me remind you, these are individuals that that were already filtered by saying they would like personal instruction. So these weren't just that everybody who said they were sort of interested. No, specifically, they were interested in personal instruction. 37% of them uh, on the hunting side and 46% on the target shooting side had already tried the activities. And for many of them, I think it was like over, well, I don't remember the exact, exact percent, but for many of those that had already tried it, a family member or friend was the one that introduced them to it early on, but something caused them to stop. And these folks did not go to self-learning tools online. They did not just figure stuff out on themselves. As a matter of fact, only a fraction of them, I think less than 2% preferred online or self-learning tools. Overwhelmingly, these folks said, no, 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 no. We need personal instruction. We're going to talk about what their definition of personal instruction is. But I, I just wanted, I think this is important to note, we're not just talking about people who are interested and have zero personal experience. As it turns out, a huge proportion of these folks that are interested in this kind of instruction have already had at least one experience. I think that's useful to know because if I'm targeting a, a potential audience, I would rather target people who have some experience that they can tie personal motivations to, as opposed to someone straight out of the blocks with, zero personal experience. Yeah. Two points, if I could add to that. Um, the experience point is just someone may have been at a friend's house for the weekend and their father or you know, a cousin took them out to the range. We hear a lot of different reasons why it's there. So it's very legit. It's just that when they went back home, they didn't have that community support, friends close by. It could have just been at summer camp where they got the flavor. So then the Orem model and the trial stage was there. But trial is a lot more than just one exposure because in the survey and you'll see in the full report a lot of people are expressing a high level of interest in being instructed instructed by someone and they've already been out two times five times some of them even ten times but the experiences they had to date were not enough to make them an independent confident participant so even when they're having that trial could be multiple times they're still missing that instruction to make them confident to have them go out and buy their own product. So really talking to people about their initial experiences and how you design their mentor, <laughs> their instruction process. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, that is going to be a while. It is critical. We got to talk to them there. Um, so it, it, yeah, a couple points there, the, the trial stage, it, it varies so much. Um, but also the second point then is um, don't completely rule out the video and online. That's absolutely critical. When the events are done, what Alex is sharing yesterday, what IHEA has is absolutely vital. People are staying, saying they still want, they need the video and the online components, but that's a support mechanism when they're actually in the instruction phase. And then it may become that critical component once the instruction phase is over and they're on their own for them to continue and become that confident individual. Exactly. Okay. And that, that, that's a great point. All of these resources, folks, whether we're talking about this personal instruction, whether about we're talking about online tools, these cannot be exchanged um, between themselves. So in other words, one isn't as good as the other. Frequently, they are all needed, but they are all needed in a particular sequence. And that's kind of what we're discovering with this project is most everybody recognize that, hey, to get me started or to get me started again. I need some specific personal interaction. Once that's over, I'm going to need something different. And that's where some of these other tools come in mind. So let's drop the idea that these are just like um, fuses that we can just exchange one for the other. We can plug pieces in and plug pieces out. No, they're they're much more tied to the process an individual is going through and the stage they're in, as opposed to one model fits huge audiences for all things. Okay, here's a fun one, one of my favorites. As it turns out, between a, an instructor and a student, age and gender matter very, very little, way less than we thought. There was 
th this one was one that all of us stopped and said, hey, let's look at these data again really, really clearly. But when, no matter where, uh, who we were asking, when they said, hey, what is your st a strong preference? Even if it was just a preference, not like, hey, would you not go? You know, like, what's the point at which you will look at a class and say, I'm not going to participate? There was no primary trigger point for either instructors or students. Um, now, I want to make something clear here on the second point, and I wish we would have asked some more questions here. Well, actually, there's two points I want to make. Number one is what people say on a survey isn't always doesn't always drive behavior, but in our case, the, 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 the trend was so strong, I actually believe in this case, it, it is a predictor of behavior. Secondarily, there's a lot more to this that we did not ask. We didn't ask about ethnicity. We didn't ask about culture. We didn't ask about urban rural and other things that may have an influence. Now we may be wrong there too. And the influence is less strong than we anticipated, but it might not be. These are questions again, we wanna ask in the future. But from the outset, I think it's encouraging that students don't care if it's an old white guy and old white guys don't care if it's a, a, an urban Gen Zer. They yeah. were all, they all figured there's ways they could get along and it wasn't a preclusion for them being involved in a program. Yeah, and this a comment I'll make here, and luckily Matt's in Colorado and I'm in Florida because he might punch me a little bit on this one. Um, it's important to realize that this is based on survey research, this, this number here. And there are sometimes in survey questions, people will start telling you what they think they're supposed to say. Yeah. And so that's the reason why we're going to do some follow up research on this one, because it's like the classic question. We've run many of our surveys in the past for private companies. They want to know how important is the product is made in the USA. And 80 percent of consumers will say, yes, I, I, I buy made in USA. It's really important. In reality, it's a tiny percentage because they buy on price and no one's looking. They're going to buy on price. And so it's a situation. People say, does it matter who you learn from? Who's your instructor? Who's your student? And they're going to most many of them will say it doesn't matter when it really might matter. And on top of that, I saw Jen Davis get a comment scroll by here, too. And I agree too that even though they may accept someone who's different, their attitude towards that person may not be the same as it would be to someone else. So this is something we're going to look at even further because it is a critical question. So well, with it, the it, 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 word, it's Matt Express. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, that, that last point, I think, um, is important. On the focus groups, when we dr drilled into this a little bit, because this was some surprise, a little bit surprising, what we did find is if the individuals on either side of this relationship, whether it be a student or, or, a, or a, an instructor, if they were closed minded, if they were judgy, if they were um, if they seemed to push an agenda, then age and gender as well as pretty much any other distinctive characteristic became very important. So uh, I, I actually agree with Rob a lot on this one. This is surprising, but it needs to be filtered a little bit because I think the threshold of acceptance is much lower than this number might indicate. And that um, if all things were equal and everybody was a beautiful person, this wouldn't matter. But if there's any differences of opinion, this stuff might matter. So we're talking a lot about it. Obviously we need to drill more down into this, but on the outset, at least it's leaning more toward an encouraging trend, I think, in my estimation, than a discouraging trend. Okay, let's keep chugging right through here. I'll, I'll actually, I'm going to do a process check. Rob, are there any other questions or comments that have come in that we should address about the previous findings? Nothing critical. I'm making a few notes here, but I love the discussion going here on the side. Keep rolling. All right, keep it going. Okay, this one probably isn't surprising, but it was a large enough finding that it bears um, stating. Most part, uh, most people who are already um, hunting and shooting and those that would probably identify as, you know, a shooting sports participant or a hunter are already doing mentoring. There's not a huge pool of, of instructors out there or potential instructors out there who haven't already done mentoring. And I'm using the word mentoring carefully here um, because what they are doing is taking out friends and family. What we discovered is that the vast majority of active participants in these activities um, know that if they are asked to teach someone, they should do so. And many, nearly all, or most of them, I think it's like three quarters, um, have already done that within their close social circle. What's interesting though, is in doing that, they don't see themselves as instructors. 
It's much more of a, well, somebody asked me and I know how, so of course I will. So about three quarters of them are already doing this. So um, it's not as if there's a huge number of people out there who are just selfishly going into the woods or going to the range by themselves and not taking somebody. As it turns out, many of them are. So when we're looking at in, uh, um, um, finding new instructors, recognize you're going to be pulling instructors from those who have already done it, and you can leverage some of their motivations for already doing it, as well as um, some of their skills. Now, I want to pair this finding with the next one because there's 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 a chain of associated findings here. So this one, you know, tells us most everybody that's already doing these activities is already doing mentoring in their social circle. Um, and interestingly, when asked, "Would you take somebody else out that's outside your social circle?" They indicated that, yeah, I probably would. However, there's some specific ways that that needs to happen. Unfortunately, it's not quite as easy um, as we might think it is, but there's one specific thing that we can do. Um, they said that personal invitations are what's most impactful for them. That's often how they started mentoring in the first place is because somebody in their social circle either asked them directly to take them or someone in the social circle asked them to take somebody else out. So it's that trust within the social circle that causes them to be willing to take them out. And it's not like these folks had a threshold, like, hey, I took out one or two, I'm done. No, it was a continual presence of willingness that they expressed. Having another hunter or shooter ask them was a surprisingly powerful motivator. Having a peer recommend and say, would you take this person out or somebody else was ranked very highly as something that would make him do it. Unfortunately, organizational asks were not deemed as important or as effective. Um, however, I, I, I don't think either Rob or I believe organizations should not ask hunters, but I think we should be careful in how we do it and think, are there other ways we can incentivize the asking in the right way? Frankly, the, the, the ability to just broadcast invitations and the people, the number of people you might impact could outweigh the you know less effective measure because you'll get more. So the recommendation is simply, we have to make asks of existing hunters and shooters specifically to take someone out. So if we want to do something that's closer to mentoring than instructing, the ask is the critical thing for them. But unfortunately, it needs to be an ask um, that is more laced with trust than just a general ask. And that came through. I encourage you to read the transcripts in the focus groups that DJ Case did. It came out over and over. People said, well, yeah, it's important to take other people out. Well, how come you haven't done it? Um, no one's asked me to. It, just, it comes up all the time, either to be an instructor or to ask someone to take you out. It's yeah. critical. And, and I think it was a combination of nobody asked me and I don't feel qualified. So they're, they're generally a pretty humble lot. If they took somebody out successfully, they didn't view themselves as, as an instructor. And, and I actually don't know if it's a lack of confidence or it's just, I, I also wondered if it was a bit offensive to for them to think of themselves as instructors because they were doing it out of personal motivation. I'm not really sure what it is, but the point is between those two factors, nobody asked me and I don't see myself as doing anything special here and I'm not a qualified instructor. Those are two, let's say, psychological barriers that we we would need to address if we really want to increase the instructor pool. Okay. Now, the there, there, there's, I'm sorry, what'd you say, Rob? Yeah, keep going. We're good on time. Just keep it rolling. Yep. Okay. So this is kind of like the third point in this. What do, how big is the potential instructor pool? OK, so we first said, hey, nearly everybody is doing it who's already hunting and shooting sports. They're willing to do more if they're asked correctly. That, but then here is the sort of uh, the, the fly in the ointment. Um, most aren't initially interested in taking those outside their social circle. OK, they're willing to do it, but primarily inside their social circle. So. Take that to mean what it wants, but I, but what you want. But I think this is a point that really is is a dis, allows a distinction between this mentoring concept. Okay, what they're talking about is let's call organic mentoring, the apprenticeship 
tight social circle um, process of passing on skills and knowledge. That That is something unique and special. And that's what most hunters and shooters are fine and easy to do or, or and, and, are, and are able to do and fine with doing. Then there's this other thing that outside of a social circle, when we get into this programmatic structure, the, the world that a lot of us are living in, that's where things break down a little bit for a potential instructor pool. So as a community, I think we need to separate these two thoughts and recognize when we go to uh, someone and ask them to be an instructor outside of their social circle, we're asking them to do something different than what it, mentoring is in their heads. Again, emphasizing why we need to be careful with language and we need to be careful with how we're framing this and why. Yeah, I'm going to take a quick stop here, Matt, about there's a question that came up earlier and you're touching on it now. A question from Samantha about using the term mentoring. And I know you personally feel the same way, too, on this point, is that we as a community can still use the term mentoring. And we have a definition that was developed in consultation with the four regional marketing committees that's in the report. But we're very, I guess they were tighter in how we use that word mentoring, being more of a one on one to one on four type of interaction not as broad as it was in the past. So we talk about different types of R3 programs, could be derbies, classroom, mentoring. The term is okay there. But when you're talking about your actual program, you need to talk about instructors, students, program instruction. So just thought a good case to knock that question out now. Yep, I appreciate that. And, and whether we change the word mentoring or we use um, descriptors like organic mentoring versus programmatic mentoring, I think all those are acceptable. We just as a community need to um, talk about that. So quickly, some additional recommendations based on this point. Um, note that th there are, there are, what we found is that people who did a lot of mentoring were more likely to mentor people outside their social circle. We call those super instructors, <laughs> find all of those that you can, um, as w and, and try to focus on them as well as those that already have a predisposition to mentor outside their social circle. And then you're going to hear us recommend a bunch, the idea that a role an organization has in this programmatic mentoring is pairing up an instructor and uh, a student um, by strategically understanding the headspace both those groups or those individuals are in and what they need what appeals need to be made to them and providing a service where those two can get together and start to build something organically between themselves whether it be one to one or one to four okay for the sake of time let's keep rolling through here we have a, a bunch of stuff um, yet to go through Okay, building on that line of what can an organization do, fortunately, the potential instructors of those that are already participants, um, they, they trust organizations, particularly trusted organizations, and there are two main trusted organizations, agencies and conservation NGOs came up very strongly. They want those organizations to help introduce them to students. If an organization came to them and said, hey, we want to put you and a bunch of people like you, potential mentors, in a room with potential students and, and kind of find a way to get you guys to work together, the potential instructors said, yep, we would trust them to do that. Specifically, um, the, one of the, the, the things that those instructors called for is that one of the reasons they don't go outside their social circle is they don't know how to find um, the right people, they don't know the venue and the logistics of just getting them together. You know, on the focus groups, this came out, folks said, how am I supposed to find these other folks? Am I just supposed to walk into a farmer's market and just grab people and say, you want to go hunting with me? So we recognize that, hey, there does need to be an intermediate uh, intermediary there. And fortunately, um, potential instructors trust agencies and NGOs to help do that. So again, we organizations have this role of potential brokering these relationships and providing a, a, a venue for these relationships between student and instructor to form and solidify. If I add on to that a bit too, um, as you read through the reports, and some of you probably will, it's pretty thick, um, but you'll see other areas in there where sometimes the state might be the better person to run an aspect of an instructing program. But we see, for example, in the target shooting results, a lot of our potential students are saying, I'd be more comfortable if I could go somewhere that is public, like Cabela's or a Bass Pro Shops, to have that initial instruction to start there. Point is, don't think if you're a state agency or an NGO, you've got to run all aspects of your instructing program on your own. Partnership opportunities, we don't have it in the slide deck here, 
are new are numerous and immense. There's all good examples in the Midwest with the states and Pheasants Forever and other groups out there. Turkey Federation, outstanding. But there's a lot more room to build these partnerships at the local level too, and you'll see that in, in the report. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, an encouraging sign. Actually, a few more people have joined. Awesome. I expected by this time about half people to have, <laughs> have dropped off. So thank you all for your endurance. And if you're watching YouTube videos, I don't want to know about it. Okay, um, let's bust through these last ones. This is an important and somewhat, I don't know if it's surprising or not, but as it turns out, material incentives, whether it be for instructors or students, really aren't important, but particularly for instructors. So stuff, We uh, there, there's been a theory... A, a long time in the R3 community that, boy, if we could just give, if we could incentivize these potential hunters or shooters to mentor, you know, let's, they, they would do it. But as it turns out, they didn't rank any sort of material incentives very highly at all. I mean, just, it was very, very low in terms of importance. Most of them are doing it and would continue to do it based on very good personal values. I think this is the right thing to do. I care about passing on the sport. This is something important to me and it changed my life and I think it could change somebody else's life. So when we think about trying to reach these folks and convince them to instruct outside their social circles, we should leverage the tar out of those points to, um, and, and make sure that we believe what they are saying as well. Now, that said, of the small percentage of potential instructors who did favor material incentives, access to additional hunting opportunities um, was a primary motivator and oftentimes stated as one of the main reasons they don't instruct others because they don't have a place to take them. So if we are going to offer incentives, um, think about providing special access as well as the, the number two thing was something kind of like pro deals or discounts on equipment. I think there's a great partnering opportunity with industry right there. But again, I want to emphasize, this isn't a huge factor in a hunter or shooter deciding to mentor outside their social circle. Okay, we hit on this already, so we can bust right through it. Those that are interested in instructing, instructing often feel unqualified or too inexperienced. They don't see themselves as good enough to take out somebody new, you know, or whether they don't feel themselves are good enough, or maybe they're just not confident. I don't know. But they, they don't see themselves at a level that is needed to be a good instructor. So resources would help y'all. This is another good thing I think we can do. If we listen very carefully, and this is where more research is needed, more asking is needed. If we listen carefully to what the instructors say they need and provide stuff that they need, not stuff that we think they should need, there's a big distinction there between what we think is right as an organization and what they actually need. If we're willing to listen to what they actually need, this could help them feel more confident. Some things that came up in the study, um, a checklist of the specific skills that would be helpful to teach a new student, the gear that that student needs to purchase, the specific knowledge points that that student probably needs, and then organizational assistance. I alluded to this early. Some organization that will help that instructor and student feel comfortable because someone's watching the door. You know, someone's doing background checks. Someone's making sure nobody crazy is coming in the door from either end, whether from the student side or the instructor side. These are all things that we as a community can do to help. So kind of uh, in summary of, of the last several points, there's a, there, although it's may not be as large as we'd hoped, there is a good percentage of active participants out there at all experience levels who I think could be convinced to instruct someone outside their social circle. And we shouldn't just focus on the super instructors. But if we're not going to just focus on the super instructors, we need to recognize to get more people instructing, they're going to need some specific resources and we need to be prepared to listen to what those are and provide them specifically. On there, uh, this is an easy one. I just want to go ahead, Rob. As mentioned, there the issue about a lot of these beginners and some of us in the focus group results too. And I see a discussion, Mark, great comment about the liability issue. This is where it goes back to partnership. Think of your strengths as a state agency, especially. The liability is often much more easier and more manageable. But same way with these people who don't see themselves as experts, they're willing to assist. They may be looked upon as someone who's a part of an instruction program. Just don't make them think like the whole thing depends on them alone, that they know they have support more than a volunteer can all the woodwork to give you a hand. Agreed. Right. 
Okay, this one's an easy one. Don't have to belabor the point at all. Um, it's just, I want to emphasize it, that in current generations, I think this is as much of a generational impact as anything, um, and it is not becoming less. It is becoming stronger. Folks, particularly students, but also instructors, need to feel that safety is emphasized in the beginning, middle, and end, and at every scale of the process. They are very risk averse and risk sensitive. So we have to be cognizant of that. We can't get impatient. And we have to, again, listen to what they need to hear, even if we think it unreasonable. Doesn't matter. They'll learn when they need to. At the outset, them feeling safe is a very, very significant factor in them deciding to be part of a instruction relationship. They won't even acknowledge your okay. if you don't say safety. You got the very first contact, you've got to say safety. They won't even respond to your marketing. I had to put yep. it in there. So blow on through. Yep. <laughs> no, good, good email marketing point. Um, okay, more so a little bit of good news, why I want to bring this out is that this was another surprise to me. I had assumed that those who were seeking personal instructions, we're talking about potential students here, would much prefer an experienced family or friend to take them out. Not true. They almost equally preferred or would be just as fine with some other expert. And in the focus group, it's interesting. Many times they said, we would prefer an outside expert rather than someone in our family. We might trust them more. Um, only if that expert is somehow validated uh, that as an expert, and we're, I'm, I'll mention this uh, near the end here, but having some sort of a certification or some organization that says, yes, this person is experienced. Um, Potential students are fine with that, so it doesn't have to be a friend or family. So this should be encouraging to us as organizations trying to do these programs in that if we relay the experience of the right type of individuals as instructors, these students don't have a problem with that. So again, I want to emphasize, organizations can broker, have a role to broker these relationships and create the right amount of, or create the right incentives and enforced points that both feel comfortable going forward. It's just, you know, again, the students would like to hear some organization, trusted organization, and often agencies are a very high trusted organization, if not the highest, say, hey, this instructor, trust us, they are experienced. If that's in place, then a huge barrier comes down. Okay, we're about there, hang in there with me. So final point before we go over some quick things, no big surprise here. Um, but it comes up so often, folks, and, and, and I hear this, and I know Rob does, this message confused so many times. Students and instructors, uh, younger generations, older generations, urban people, rural people, they do not prefer or respond to the same types of communication. And may, for many of you, this is probably obvious, but this is still a pervasive problem in our community, thinking that we can just send out one type of message and we're gonna get everybody that's involved. For students, overwhelmingly, social media was the number one way they, they would prefer to get more information or be contacted about an instruction opportunity. Now, what's interesting with students is that a State Fish and Wildlife Agency website was a close second but I would encourage, it's probably a close second because after they get the first message that interests them off of social media, that's where they go to find more information. So agencies, you need to be thinking about your websites as landing places that are have their information tailored and geared toward a student that is looking for more information. On the instructor side, social media was like the sixth thing. <laughs> so big surprise there for older generations. Uh, they're probably largely rural. Social media is not a thing for them. Number one uh, was being asked by another hunter. It came up again when we asked, what's the best way to find other people like you? Well, some ask somebody. That was number one. Number two was agency websites. So what we did find is that agency websites are kind of a good middle ground where both parties can come, again, that brokering type deal, to get information um, and as a, a, as, a, as a general hub. But I would encourage two things. Number one, that's probably not the place they start. Um, maybe some for instructors, but definitely not for students. They need some other message that gets them to go to the agency website. That's thing number one. Thing number two, you got to make sure you review your website 
with um, good marketing practices, a lot of the things you all have already heard at this, this forum and you will hear in the future, to make sure that the, the stream of information and resources is seamless and easy to find for the people that are trying to go there. Let me jump in here, Matt. There's a, a comment here um, from Eddie Herndon, which is a point you and I have discussed here too, about the specific specific type of social media and other media too that would be best. Um, that was actually the impetus for submitting the proposal for the second round of research was that very topic because we thought in this first stage, we had better identify the strategies we should take. And the second one would be more of the tactics that to even if you go on Facebook, what would the messages be, for example, and how you, of course, how you have to word it, um, what types of chat rooms, podcasts, everything else is the primary part of the next round of research. So a lot more to come on that because as a marketer, that, 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 that's the first question I always ask. I do want to take a quick little sidetrack and emphasize at this point, too, and Matt, if I'm taking away the thunder from a later slide, my apologies up front. I don't recall at this moment. It is important that when you're promoting your programs, let's say you're, you have both target shooting and hunting. You don't, while the messaging, the motivations might be the same for someone to stand up and say, I'll be an instructor. You don't want to promote the two together because some people don't have interest in one or the other program. A lot of folks want to learn how to, to, to fire a handgun, but they have no interest in hunting and clouding the two messages would cloud your recruiting ability. For a small group of people, they don't want to know the hunting part, but that's only a small part. So just you have to separate your messages to the different activities. Um, we'll get more information to you later next year on the specifics of how to communicate with them. Back to you, Matt. Okay. So looking at the process here, y'all, we've been doing this for about 50 minutes. And, we, and I, I warned you this was going to be intense. Um, I've got a couple more slides of just general useful things, but I want to take a pause because you can read these in um, the handout that, the, the council has provided you. So I wanna take a beat and just ask, are there any burning questions that would be more useful for us to answer in these next couple minutes than just reading through these points or looking at these points you guys could read elsewhere? Any comments out there? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. So I wanna yep. take a minute to make sure we're missing anything. So here's what I wanna do, folks. I'm gonna start going into these but if Rob, if you see C1 typed in, I'm gonna stop or stop me and we'll address that. I'll keep on doing that. No problem. Okay. Unless we can talk to it at the end of time allows that we haven't touched on, but keep going. Sure. Okay. So now re remember we made the distinction between organic one-on-one -on -one social group mentoring and programmatic mentoring. So even though we've made that distinction, and, and maybe in some ways it might sound like we're we're getting down on programmatic mentoring programs. That's not the intent. We're emphasizing these to make this very, these very important distinctions. So this, these next few points I wanna cover are the kind of the, the, the hopeful, well, what can we do part? So these are the recommendations that we make based on the findings um, on what you can do programmatically that is prudent for the, the, the type of effort your organization might wanna do. Number one, nobody wants to go to the field right away. The first interaction between instructors and students should be a small group setting that is informal and gives people a chance to know each other. I want, uh, I think BHA and other groups that start their, their events like this um, are very prudent based on our results. Everybody said that. We don't want to go right to the field. We want to take some time and uh, learn a little bit about each other and how this works. We talked about safety again. Um, just... Mention it one more time. Make sure safety is uh, is there. If you're if you're at at a, a brewery and you're having uh, these instructors and students get together, when you give your opening talks, emphasize that we're going to be safe no matter what we do. Okay, um, for those prospective students, when we ask them, um, what would you like the most, or what is stopping you from learning, access uh, to places to go is one of the most effective ways. Um, to get them involved. They don't know where to go. They want to know where to go. And they claim that would be an incentive on both sides of the coin, on the instructor coin or on the instructor side, as well as the student side. So if you are going to focus any of your efforts on um, tactics or incentives, do it on access to areas or, or hunting opportunities. Um, emphasize again, there's, there's good news here. 
Authoritative organizations are valued highly by both students and instructors, but particularly students going, hey, if some organization makes a program that I can get instructed by officially, I trust that. And when we ask them, what organizations do you trust? State fish and wildlife agencies and conservation NGOs came up at the top. So, hey, good job agencies, your brand of trust is getting across. All right. Um, points here. You mentoring want questions matter. You want to wrap, run through this last go slide ahead. here. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Just, a uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Just, um, Matt Bartley, you talked about the input and the follow-up on the research. I just want to emphasize there that we'll be working very closely with the regional R3 committees as before. So that will be our official conduit for questions we bring into the process, but please send us your questions directly also to Matt or myself. Um, we'll get them built in there. Um, we, we definitely need those there. Uh, this comment, Jen, your question about the mention of matchmaking, are there effective programs there already? I'm not expert on that one. Matt, did you want to touch on that one? I know there's other people here in the discussion that that could be a discussion afterwards about. Yeah, that, 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 that's an easy, that's an easy answer. Uh, no. As of yet, and based on the, the catalog of, of mentoring programs that we did, as far as I know, no one is doing this um, at, at any scale um, and definitely not programmatically as an organization. I'm, I hope I'm wrong and something has started in the past couple of months, but as of now, no. Yes, uh, thank you. And then um, some of the other comments I'm taking here, won't go with them all now, but there are questions and some points I want to put in the research. Justin just posted one about creating and instilling confidence in people who are on the bubble about becoming an instructor. So those are great questions. Keep them rolling. We'll put them into the research here. Okay. And also a comment too by Scott mentioned about the um, hunting debate work that Duda has done. It talks about it because it also investigates what resonates with people. And that's an ass, it's an absolutely amazing piece of information. I do encourage people to read because there's a lot of tangential insights that will apply to the applications, what we're seeing here. So back to you. Okay, very good. Final question. Leah, last, last couple of minutes, we'll uh, uh, take it home here. I think this point here is probably one of the more important ones I hope you remember. Um, only 25% of those who per, um, asked to be taught by an experienced instructor, only 25% of those wanted to do it alone. It means 75% preferred to either do it with their family or with at least one family or friend member. Folks, the idea of this one-to-one -one thing, programmatically at least, doesn't seem to be wanted by students. So if you're going to do a mentoring program, small group, and being able to take a trusted friend, I think will get you much farther down the road. Okay. Um, we talked about this. Potential students like the online um, or prefer the online video in terms of tools. And we asked, what is most helpful to you? The online video and course instruction. but Without a doubt, it was only as, um, or it was in conjunction with hands-on experience. So don't expect that online video courses in and of themselves will reach all of the students that we were talking to, or at least the respondents to on this survey. Social media was the top method by students. I emphasize that. Um, to, something that I, I'm sure Keith Warnke and, and many others from the original R3 days would be so happy to hear. I'll reinforce again. That self-sufficiency, supplying themselves with their own protein was the top motivation motivator for those who want that personal instruction. So emphasizing that, it's not about the necessarily the outdoors, connection with nature, all that. It's a self-sufficient sufficiency. Their values as an individual to supply themselves with meat is a primary motivator. So keep that in mind with these particular individuals. That, that last point for everyone out there, like Matt and I are over 35. Not only are we slow at multitasking, we often still have a hard time accepting that. Um, but as I see in the research that we've done, uh, and the responsive management has been saying it for years too, that is becoming more and more of a reason for people to get into hunting and especially that younger generation, not so much the older folks, but the paradigm has shifted. And I hate that term paradigm. So if you're over 35, it is true that hunting for the meat cell sufficiency is absolutely critical. It didn't even appear on the map hardly 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up, y'all. And I, you can read everything else in here, but I wanna emphasize the last thing because my uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if I didn't. 
whether it be mentoring, well, any type of R3 effort, but particularly this type of effort as, as well, we still did find a lack of real good outcome-based metrics that validate good approaches or effective approaches versus then less effective approaches. Folks, you have got to embed evaluation from the outside of your program and make it every part of your program's implementation so you know if you're doing a great job or only a mediocre job. At the end of the day, remember, if every R3 effort has to either document how many new participants it made or an increase in avidity of existing participants. If you can't show me one of those two pieces of data, there's no way you can even ever prove to me or your um, your partners or your leadership that your program is working. Okay, last, last here, just wanna emphasize that as Rob has said all throughout, the research is ongoing. Um, this is the beginning of a process. I desperately wish I was with you all and we could spend two more hours talking about this, but thanks for your attention. Um, and more will more will come on this in the future. The final report, so the big daddy, um, the 189 pages, we're in final steps of editing that. So in the meantime, chew on that um, uh, overview that's available in the, the forum handout, and be sure to you know get us after this, send us emails, give us a call to ask any other additional questions. Rob, I'll kick it back to you. Um, I just want to emphasize again, we need your input. There's a lot of new things um, coming out of this research that's surprising us. And often with new research, as Matt first mentioned, you create more questions than you answer. That's a sign of good research. Also, you create doubt. Sometimes what you're learning may not be the actual fact. It might be something correlated to the true fact we have to dig down into. So if you heard something, you think there might be a root cause that we missed, we need to know that, please, so we can research it further. So I appreciate it. I'm just talking from the research standpoint. Matt is the applications expert by far better than I am. So um, any you know, challenge to numbers, let me know. Any challenge applications, Matt's there. I do want to, again, shout out to DJ Case for this phenomenal work they did. We brought them in late in the project when we decided to go online. Um, the online focus groups are awesome because you, you get a national perspective. They're not all getting input from just one town. So look at those videos, read the reports. Please communicate back with us because we don't have the opportunity for that one-on-one -on -one discussion like we typically do after a presentation to hear your individual thoughts. So thank you, everyone. And Matt, please close her up. Well, um, I'm looking at down at the questions. Um, so we have about 15 minutes more on this, at least okay. if I'm understanding the agenda correctly. So yep. um, any other questions or points you'd like us to go back over? Again, I just I'm desperate to see y'all's faces. Um, we can learn so much from there and see your hands yeah. raised. But since we we what, what we from Justin Greider, and he was how to as one I mentioned before, but how do we create and instill confidence in folks who are on the bubble to becoming an instructor? And I'll if, I'll take first shot there, and um, then Matt, you clean that up. Is okay. they don't have confidence in themselves. We had some people in in the focus groups, or one in particular who just recently graduated as a student and they're new, but they're excited and they wanted to share it with other people. So letting people know that you don't have to be the expert. You're not gonna have to carry the world on your shoulders. We have this for you. It could be a place to shoot. We have that for you. It could be the checklist. We have this other for you. It could be the liability issues. Um, just let people know in the recruitment process that you don't have to be the expert. And I think we'll see a lot more potential instructors come out of woodwork. Matt. Yeah, the, that that is kind of point one. There, there are two points that I think one an organization should focus on. Rob just hit the first one. It's a lack of, of it's almost like self confidence. Them hearing that they are valued, that they are needed, and the experience they have is relevant to somebody else. Um, that takes specific messaging to get people over. Okay, just think about how hard confidence is for people in general. And now think about how difficult it can be for an organization to try to instill that confidence. I'm not, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you need to target it specifically. So that's thing number one. Thing number two was, again, I'll, I'll go back to a member of the focus group that kind of encapsulated a lot of the data that we see in the survey when he said, I got no problem taking out somebody else, but I don't have the time to find them. I don't have the time to... Um, uh, do the you know set up the first meet and greet. I'm I'm a little nervous um, that that uh, I have everything that I need. 
it would be great if some organization could understand what I'm willing to offer. You know, I forget what he was. He was a particular kind of hunter. Let's just say he was primarily a pheasant hunter, right? So that he said, it'd be great if an organization would know that, hey, I'm willing to take somebody pheasant hunting. hunting. I'm not going to take him deer hunting. I'm not going to take him turkey hunting, but I'll take him deer hunting. And, you know, I'm this kind of a person. And they in turn could find someone who's interested in going pheasant hunting with a person like me. If they would just do that, if a trusted organization would do that and broker that for me, I'd be willing to do it. And on that, you know, when the individual expressed that, almost everybody else on the, on the call continued to emphasize that. It's like, yeah, just somebody set that up so I don't have sort of the social burden to go out and sift through a bunch of people to find just the right one. If someone could do that for me, an organization that I trust, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be happy to help. So those two things are areas that I would focus on to build that confidence and convert existing hunters and shooters into instructor hunters and shooters. Okay, thank you. Uh, another comment here, Doug Burt, uh, the report is not yet in the, in the data warehouse. It will be. We're still going through a proofing stage with it. Um, and I, I'm speaking out loud here without permission, but I assume the, the council will promote it once it's available. So I'm putting them up to that task. And of course, we'll promote it to other resources too. So it, it will be there in the summary, I believe is available there now, the executive summary. Um, I do want to make a quick side comment um, based on point Liz that posted earlier as building off a partnership comment. Everything you're hearing about hunting and target shooting, much of this applies to fishing, but it won't be the same. I do want to say we did ask in the screener questions about people who had, were interested in learning how to hunt or shoot. Fishing was built in there because when we asked the question about their interest in hunting and shooting, it was buried in with other activities like cycling and kayaking and rock climbing. And so people didn't know the survey was opening up about hunting and shooting until we have to be identified those who had interest. And there's even a larger number of people who had interest in going fishing. Um, so people probably tried it once in their life and like to go again. So the potential there is for fishing also for you folks who are working on both hunting and fishing programs. Uh, Mac, I could throw another question at you. I think we got a few more minutes. Yeah, let, I want to make one just sure. uh, one point on what you're saying there. The um, the 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 crossover ability of these findings, Liz. I I believe based on a lot of other surveys that have looked at you know hunting and shooting sports and and values and whatnot and the parallels there. I believe a lot of this is highly um, uh, correlative to the fishing side. I'm sure there's going to be a few key differences and we could guess what those are, but it'd be nice to do this work on that side as well. The other thing I'd like to point out, out is though that there are some important nuances. So for instance, the motivations for hunting and shooting sports instructors, i.e. they don't care about incentives, they, just, they do it for personal values, those were nearly identical. So we didn't see a difference between hunting instructors and shooting instructors, okay? They're similar people. So you might say, okay, we can ask for both at the same time. I think that's reasonable. However, you can't make the same program for hunting and shooting students. One thing that we found in our results is that over three quarters of potential um, target shooting students, pay attention to this folks, over three quarters of them had zero or averse interest in hunting. So just because they're a target shooter doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a hunter. So you can find the instructors the same way, but the students need different things. So let's keep that in mind and recognize, let's do the research to figure out where those important differences are so that we don't waste time and effort. Okay. Thank you. Um, two other comments or questions here within the Q&A box. One of them I'll throw out here first. I think folks listening in might be able to type in answers to it. And this is from Nick Fasciano. It says, are there examples you've seen of programs where students cycle through the program and then become instructors later on? Now, they won't be expert, but they can teach the basics. We saw one person in the focus group that did that. But Matt, did you want to address that? And then if people have answers to that, please type it in the screen. So again, any examples of programs where students have cycled through and then became instructors afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a lot of programs out, out there. They don't identify themselves as mentoring programs, but things like Scholastic Shooting Sports, um, uh, NASP, um, 
on, on the hunting side, I'm, I'm trying to think about this. I know uh, various organizational programs like the Learn to Hunt series in, in Wisconsin. Um, frequently, they what they found after the first iteration or two is that past students liked the, the process so well that they wanted to be an instructor and those programs made modifications. So essentially how I'd answer your question is, I believe, I believe past R3 experience has shown us there is a large potential, well, let's say a significant potential for existing or let's say graduated students to want to become mentors. However, in many cases, we don't design a program with that process in mind. We do it as an afterthought. And what I would encourage is, given what we've learned about motivations of instructors who want to pass on their experience, it would be very prudent to build into your program from the outset or make a plug in right now that makes it clear to students going through the program that if they want to help mentor somebody, you have or instruct somebody else, you have resources for them. Great. Thanks. Um, I would be a little tight in time, but a few more things have popped up here. Nicole Swinney, uh, you, you have a comment about communication preferences across different ethnic groups. Um, in one of the discussion sessions yesterday in the sidebar, we posted, and it's a Seth has a couple of reports that looked at the interest various ethnic groups and groups of interest had in hunting and target shooting, two different reports. And in there, we went down into detail, everything from messaging that they would like, they would prefer, Imagery, we gave them a series of photos, what would you know, get more likely to grab their attention, including how to reach out to them, what types of media, what types, it's by name, by type of actual named media, whether it's electronic or traditional. So I believe those reports are gonna be posted to the warehouse. Um, I think uh, uh, Samantha was gathering those reports. I'd recommend you reading through those. And that's something, of course, too, we'll look at next year, because again, that's one of the core reasons for that next project is to, find those tactical steps we need to do to really connect better, to recruit more students and instructors. And Matt, maybe this one of the last comment, how much time left, I'm gonna throw it back to you. I know it's been one we've been discussing here. We're trying to change the way people describe these programs as either mentoring or instructional programs. And Catherine Boswell posted here for discussion, do we now have mentoring programs and instructional programs? What's the difference? That's a great question. And uh, that as a community, we now have to figure that out. Here, here's where I think we need to do that is we need to go back to the, that definition of sort of organic, organic mentoring versus programmatic mentoring. Um, and the definition between those two, one, one is a, a social group phenomenon. The other is a surrogate that's trying to replicate important aspects of that social phenomenon. And within our community, that distinction is probably important. However, when it comes to advertising the programs and talking to our students, we don't need to worry about that distinction much because they don't wanna hear that term. So I think where our conversation needs to evolve is, is, is well, let's continue to talk about the difference between the two, but let's focus instead on the aspects of the mentoring, that social mentoring experience that we are um, being an artificial surrogate of, or let's say we're stealing those elements and putting them into a program. Let's talk about which of those are best, not use the term mentoring and call the program what the students and instructors feel comfortable with. We as a community, we can quib we'll probably quibble about this forever, but I think the point that I'd, I'd encourage us all to think about is, I think we know enough to stop branding them as mentoring programs. Instead say, we have looked, like this research has looked closely at what is important about a mentoring program that students say they want, and we are mirroring our instruction programs, our learn to hunt programs, our learn to hunt shoot, shoot programs, to embody the aspects that are valuable about that mentoring experience. Great. Well, I think we're about at the end of the line here. Um, I'd like to throw one closing comment and then back to Matt and Samantha or Kristen. Um, looking at the discussions, I've never given a presentation before where I'm trying to keep up with this fire hose of comments and then the question box. We have so much experience out here, everybody in, in, this, in this presentation now, everybody's listening in. 
there's, I can't wait for the day we can get together in person and talk this through. There's so many examples of things we pointed out that the research shows is necessary. A lot of it's already happening as a matter of just taking this experience that people have out there and passing it on to, to others. Um, so the discussion needs to continue. It's amazing to see the amount of experience and examples that are out there now. Um, I see we have great potential, I think, to really improve our instructing, instructing capabilities. So with that, I'm done. Back to you, Matt, and back to our folks. Um, thanks. You know, it's, it's a great way to wrap up. Everybody, I just want to leave you with this, that these results are not owned by Rob or I or anybody else. These are for you. These are your people. These are your target audiences. These are your programs. Um, take them and use them. This research of sitting on a shelf will never help us get better. This now belongs to you. And help us, let us know where we can help you in applying any of these because at the end of the day, we care about the future like you do. Thanks for hanging in there. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That was super informative. Um, there was some great discussion in the chat. It looks like, you know, it we're making strides even just by talking to each other virtually, which is all we can ask for in a virtual event, right? So um, that was great. We appreciate you all for being here. Um, I am going to announce the next winner of the Federal Ammunition Backpack Door Prize. And the session's winner is Justin McGuire. So Justin, if you would email Sawyer, I just put his email in the chat um, to claim your prize. And we have just about 15 minute break and we're gonna be back um, talking about retention and uh, retaining a community. So join us back here in about 15 minutes and we look forward to seeing you. Thanks.